Hello everyone, I just received this 486 motherboard, which believe it or not, I ordered months ago. That's a whole story in itself, which I will tell, but I've just been looking this board up and people say some really amazing things about it. AmmoRetro.de, a German website, which I've translated here into English, with over a hundred reviews of motherboards on their website says, it's one of the best 486 motherboards ever made. It offers state-of-the-art technology. User Nemesis on the vintage PC forum Vogons.org, after pointing out some of the known issues with the board, says, It's one of the best 486 motherboards that I've ever used. Leet user SlideRider says, The Shuttle Hot 433 is one of the best 486 motherboards for doing flat-out speedruns. I like the sound of this. Now if you've watched my channel before, you'll know that PC RetroTech is not about buying the most expensive boards to benchmark. But this board didn't come with one of the massive retro hauls that we've had on the channel. Instead, I bought it in a not working condition. The seller says that it doesn't boot. And as you can see, I got it at a much more reasonable price. Yeah, okay, I got stung a bit on the postage. And there's a story to tell there, but before I get to that, let's see if this board even starts up. I'm going to try and start this board with an Intel DX4100. Internally it has a 3 times multiplier and we usually use it with a front side bus speed of 33 MHz. The chip came out in March 1994 and if the back of the board is anything to go by, it was manufactured in about April 1995. So the DX4 is my go-to chip for testing late era 486 boards like this one. Well, I've set everything up on the edge of my bench with a stick of 32 megabyte fast page memory and a Sanglabs ET6000 video card. Now, I didn't bother connecting a floppy or a hard drive just yet, but let's power it on and see what happens. It makes sounds like it's starting up, but what I've discovered with this board is that you need to reset it before anything happens. And now you can see it counted the RAM and it tells me that the CMOS battery state is low. What a surprise and that I should run the BIOS setup utility. Now I've gone ahead and installed a floppy and hard drive in the machine and ordinarily you just set up the floppy and then run the hard drive auto detect and then everything should just work. But as you can see, it counts the RAM and it still tells me the battery is low and I should run the BIOS setup again. It seems that the seller's right, this machine doesn't boot. And yeah, it's got one of those dodgy Dallas real-time clock chips in it. These have got a battery inside them, and of course it's gone flat after all these years. Interestingly enough though, there's actually space to put a battery next to it, so maybe we could do that. But either way, I'm going to replace this chip. It's a DS12887, and I've read that the DS12887 is mostly compatible with this, depending on your board. So I'm going to try putting that on first. I'm just putting some extra solder on the pins to make it easier to get the old solder off. And in theory, it should now be easy to suck all of the solder off. Well, that wasn't so hard, and now it's time to insert the new chip. Not all of the pins are connected, and actually it goes in remarkably easily. It looks to be a bit of a mess, but that's mostly just solder flux, which we can clean off later with a bit of isopropyl alcohol. Well, let's see if things are any different this time. I'll set up the floppy drive and do the IDE auto detection and let's see if it boots. It's counting the RAM. I'm not getting the message I was getting before. This is very hopeful. And look at this, it's working, fantastic. Now I always like to check everything out with Jan Steunerbrink's CPU identification utility and everything looks okay. It's an Intel DX4 at 100 megahertz three times multiplier, 33.5 megahertz front side bus. Everything else looks right here and it is indeed a write through cache in this particular CPU revision. 
And if we run Ray Van Tassel's cache check program, everything looks okay. It says there's 16K of L1 cache in the CPU, 256K of L2 cache on the main board, and we'll upgrade this a little bit later. Then you can see all the timings. There's 10 or 11 microseconds per kilobyte for the L1 cache up to 16K, then 26 microseconds per kilobyte up to 256K, then the main memory is at 36 microseconds per kilobyte. Well, forgive me if I run a Quake benchmark already. Regular viewers of the channel are probably sick of these, but I really want to see what we've got here. 11 frames a second would be really nice. And look at that, 11.1, that's great. I haven't done anything yet. My regular viewers know exactly what I'm going to do at this point, since I've done it with so many boards over the past couple of years. I'm going to slot in my AMD 5x86, with an internal multiplier of four, and with the front side bus at 33, that'd give us 133 megahertz. But of course, we're going to push the front side bus right up to 40 for a total of 160 megahertz. Fortunately, according to the manual, this board supports both 40 and 50 megahertz front side bus. It doesn't mention 60, but that's not a major problem since my CPU won't even start up at that speed, even with a multiplier of three. I'm really liking this board and the manual. It even tells me how to set the cache to write back, but even better than that, it actually just has the AMD 5x86 in there. Now for newcomers to the channel, the best we've ever done before with all of the boards we've looked at on the channel is 16.8 frames per second in Quake with a cheap Taiwanese board that we modified to support later CPUs. Well enough screwing around, let's just start this thing up at 160 and see what happens. Well, it seems to post. Let's see whether it boots. And indeed, it seems to. It's recognizing it as an AM486DX4+, which actually has the same settings, except for the multiplier, and it's also saying 100 megahertz. But I think this is just a BIOS issue. If you look at the BIOS date, it says 1994. In the CPU identification utility, we see everything looks right. It's 160 megahertz, internal multiplier of four, front side bus of 40, and the cache is now in right back mode, which is great. Oh my goodness, we've just hit the mythical 17 frames per second at 160 megahertz. I just maxed everything out in the BIOS and it just went through flawlessly. We've not seen anything like this on the channel, and even CPU Galaxy had to go searching for a CPU that had booted 180 in order to beat this score. Well, where to from here? And I guess some of you are wondering about 150 megahertz. It's a slower CPU speed, but you get a faster front side bus at 50 instead of 40. Well, I tried it out and I got 16.7 frames per second, mainly because I had to add an additional weight state to keep the cache stable. We also tried Edo RAM instead of fast page memory, but it didn't make any difference to the scores either way. So what I'm gonna do now is add more cache and this board will support up to 512 kilobytes. And this might actually be the first board on the channel that actually works at the full 512. On the other hand, I'm not really expecting it to make a difference to the Quake score for reasons that I'll explain after I try it out. I don't believe it. I was wrong. It's actually faster, 17.5 frames per second, another record. I just don't believe this board, it's amazing. Well, in order to show just how fast and smooth this machine is now that it's running at 160 megahertz, I've loaded a game which I played a lot when I was a kid. It's a DOS 4GW game called Dark Forces, and I love this game. It's so smooth to play. And in order not to get too distracted while I'm moving about, I've cleared the level so I can tell you the hilarious story of how I came to get the board. As you know, I didn't pay much for the board itself, but the freight cost was jacked up really high. Obviously at this point, I'm not too disappointed what I paid overall. In fact, the seller's really done me a favor. But at the time, I didn't know it would work because it was advertised in a not working condition. So I asked the seller why the freight was so high. And he said, oh, that's normal. I've charged you a surcharge for storage. And I said, well, I didn't ask you to store the board anywhere for me. He said, oh no, that's my cost for storing the board for so many years. And I said, well, first of all, the board doesn't work anymore, so I'm not sure about your storage techniques. And secondly, you're the one who enjoyed the board all those years, not me. Why am I paying for that? Anyway, I didn't really think too much of it and decided not to make a big fuss of it. 
uh, maybe I'd get the board really fast if uh, you know, it was sent by a good delivery service, but unfortunately he sent it via uh, a US based delivery service, which would be well known to a lot of people and they just dumped stuff over the other side of town and make me walk more than an hour to go and pick it up. So I decided that I didn't have time on this particular occasion because uh, I am, was running a conference at the time and I decided to leave it there and see what would happen. I've actually asked their delivery driver why this happens and he says, oh, well, we don't like to do a lot of deliveries residentially in your area. We focus mainly on our business customers. <laughs> anyway, uh, I left it there and three months later, there's this frantic ringing at my doorbell as though I'm difficult to raise or something. And uh, I said third floor is normal. And instead of bringing it up to me like all the other companies do, uh, the guy just dumped it at my letterbox. Anyway, I'm really glad to have finally gotten the board and uh, it's absolutely fantastic. So now what I want to do is to show you some demos. Now I asked my friend Trickster, who's well known in the demo scene, for a recommendation of some demos which are good on a fast 486 with a sound blaster. And this one, Stars by Nuon, is really fantastic. I've got to play at least two minutes of this. Now there's much more, but I want to leave you something to play on your own machine. And I just want to remind you that there's no 3D accelerator here. This is all just off the power of the CPU alone. Really amazing demo. Now that demo was first place at Assembly 1995. And this one was third place. It was the first demo with 644-80-256 colors. So a Super VGA demo.
pretty damn impressive, but uh, let's move on from there to the third demo that I've chosen out of Trickster's selection. The final demo I'm showing is Contrast by Oxygen, and this also got a first place at a demo competition, but it's one I've not heard of called, I think, Saturna? Uh, anyway, sit back and relax and watch this one, it's fantastic. Well, I'm gonna leave that one there, and now I'm gonna give you my opinion of this board. I love this board. I wish I'd had this board right from the very beginning of the shows that we did on 486 Socket 3. And I would agree, I think this is one of the best boards I've ever personally used. Uh, I don't know whether it's one of the best in the world, but certainly out of all the boards I've tried, it's head and shoulders above. It's just flawless fantastic. So anyway, that's it for this week. Thanks again very much for watching and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.